I don't know about you, but, you know, we, we go through our readings, don't we, year by year, and it's a, a wonderful privilege for us, isn't it, to do our daily readings, and we come across the book of Ecclesiastes, and uh, there's some wonderful things in the book of Ecclesiastes, but sometimes we might think, well, why does it say that here, or um, why is that word, or that phrase used here, or what am I meant to th make of this, or think about that, and, and it can appear... Uh, a little bit disjointed uh, sometimes. So w what we're going to do this week is have a close look at the book of Ecclesiastes and hopefully by the end of the week um, have a, perhaps a more rounded appreciation of, of what's in here for our learning. So I have two key objectives really uh, for us all this week. Um, we will be obviously looking at the book and drawing some conclusions and comparing scripture with scripture to understand the book better in its own right. But my second objective is there are going to be some things which we'll look at and come across which are um, learning in progress, as it were, uh, that we won't have time to pursue all uh, the links and the threads and the themes that come out of Ecclesiastes. So there's some things that I'm going to say, well, you might want to pursue that more for yourselves in your own time and opportunity. But what we will find today, God willing, is start looking at the preacher, who is the preacher, and just to get it off the table, as it were, yes, I do believe that the backdrop to Ecclesiastes, as will consolidate throughout the week, uh, is the days of Solomon, and the context uh, of, of a lot of the phrases that are used and the words and the themes and the ideas relate back to Solomon. We'll see that quite clear, and particularly tomorrow we'll be looking at that. Now, many critics, when they look at the book of Ecclesiastes, say, well, no, it can't be Solomonic days. It's got to be after the exile, because look at this language, look at that language, look at the words used here. They're later in history, the later Hebrew that's being used here. Well, my view is, as Ecclesiastes itself says, um, that their words soon become a weariness to the flesh of the critics. So we let the scriptures interpret the scriptures, don't we? That's, that's what we do to let the Bible help us understand what the Bible itself is saying. And God can use whatever language he uses, uh, he wishes, whatever era of time he wishes. So that's not a problem to us if, if there are words that are used later in history. So we're going to consider aspects of the preacher and then we'll move a little bit later this morning into what I believe is uh, some of the structure of Ecclesiastes. So come with me then. Let's, let's begin. Let's go to first one of Ecclesiastes and I'm going to approach it this week thematically rather than verse by verse. I, I think that's more helpful uh, when we approach such a book as this. So verse one. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now, the word preacher is the word koheleth in the Hebrew, and in some books that you'll read, it is just styled, and koheleth says this, and koheleth said that. Uh, and it occurs three times in chapter 1. Let's just briefly look at that while we're here. Verse 1, we've already read that. Verse 2, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Uh, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And then verse 12, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And if you come right to chapter 12 now, as if it's book ends, we have three mentions of the preacher in chapter 12. So verse 8, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. Um, verse 9, and moreover, because the preacher was wise, so on and so forth. And verse 10, the preacher sought to find out acceptable words. So we have book ends, don't we? There's a 
there's a piece of poetry around this. We have three in chapter 1, three in chapter 12, and where's the other one then? Well, it's chapter 7. And as our classes develop, we'll see that actually chapter 7 becomes a bit of a turning point of this book of Ecclesiastes. And it's right there in chapter 7 and verse 27. Behold, this I have found, saith the preacher, counting one by one. And there's some similarities with chapter 7 and chapter 12 we'll look at later. Now the other interesting thing before we move on is that the definite article, the, the preacher, just isn't there in the original, apart from chapter 12 and verse 8. So every occurrence of the preacher is just preacher. And I'll offer a suggestion why that's the case in a moment. The only place where there is the definite article, the, is in 12 and verse 8. The preacher um, saith, the preacher, all is vanity. So that's a, a point of discussion, but uh, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Kohelet itself comes from a word which means to assemble or to gather or to convene. So we have assembled. And the preacher is an assembler, someone who, who brings the assembly together to convene. Now, this is where it starts getting fascinating. I wonder if I, I asked you the question, where do you think, in all of Scripture, in, in all of the Old Testament, and we just picked up that word, kahal, it comes from a word kahal in Hebrew, which, which literally means together to, to, to convene. Which chapter would have the most occurrences of that word? Well, this, this is where it starts forming links back to Solomon. Come to 1 Kings chapter 8. It's 1 Kings 8. You can just do a, a, a simple look in a concordance in the original and find that of all places in the scripture, the most frequent occurrences come in 1 Kings chapter 8. And this starts building a picture for us. So there we are, and this is, of course, the wonderful prayer of dedication of Solomon uh, when building the temple. Verse 1, then Solomon assembled. <laughs> That's from the same word as Kohelet, preacher. This is the word Kahol. So Solomon was an assembler. He was a convener. He was a gatherer of people. And what a momentous occasion it was of building God's house. And we've thought a little bit about that from Ephesians chapter 2 yesterday, didn't we? So here is Solomon assembling then, Kohelet, the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes. Um, and verse 2, and all the men of Israel assembled themselves, same word, Kahal, unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. Now, a very, very closely related word, it's just a, a different conjugation of the same word, kahal, comes through the rest of the chapter. So, um, if we just turn over to verse 14, and the king turned his face about and blessed all the congregation. That's, that's really from exactly the same root in the Hebrew, kahal. It's just pointed differently. The congregation, the assembly. And it's twice in verse 14, and, and all the congregation of Israel stood. Verse 22 of the same, and Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of the congregation. Same again there. Verse 55, um, just quickly turn over to there, verse 50, and he stood and blessed all the congregation. And finally, 65, um, and at that time Solomon held a feast and all Israel with him, a great, a great congregation. Seven times. Isn't that interesting? Seven times we have this word come up in 1 Kings. Now if I asked you where might be the second most frequent uh, 
accumulation of this word kahal in the Old Testament. I'm not going to look at it all, but just very, very briefly come over to uh, 1 Chronicles 28. It's actually where King David is handing over to Solomon, which is remarkable. So we get this frequency of the word kohel, kohelet, this gathering together, this convening of people, firstly with, with David as he's handing over to Solomon, and then in Solomon's prayer, particularly so. Um, just look in, in 1 Chronicles 28. And verse 8. There we have it, you see. Now therefore in the sight of all Israel, the congregation, kahal, of Yahweh, the Lord, and in the audience of our God, keep and seek, now note this as well, all the commandments of the Lord. How does Ecclesiastes end? You know it. It's all about keeping, fearing God and keeping his commandments. And again, we haven't got time to pursue this, but just look through 1 Chronicles 28 and 29, the number of times that keeping God's commandments come up. It's, it's his earthly father's recommendation, isn't it, David? Solomon, keep God's commandments, keep God's commandments, keep God's commandments. David is saying to his son, it's the best advice I can give you. Read his word. It's the best thing I can say to you, Solomon, as you begin your kingship. And it's a beautiful thing, and we'll discover this later in the week, God willing. It's a beautiful thing that Ecclesiastes ends on that note. I've got there, keeping God's commandments. So, more of that later. But I just wanted to point out um, this, this already, uh, this association between the life of, of Solomon and, and our book of Ecclesiastes that we're going to be addressing. Now, Kahal in its own right is an interesting word, the, the assembler, uh, and, and it comes up again many times in 28 and 29. I'll leave that for you, though. But the first occurrence, and I would like you to just come back to uh, Genesis 28. This is the first occurrence in the scriptures, in the original, of the word Kahal. Now, we already know that it means to assemble, to bring people together, to convene. Now look at this. Here it is. Uh, Genesis 28. This is, this is all about Jacob and, and the so-called ladder and, and such like uh, on his journey. But here, um, verse 2, Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take their wife. Verse 3, And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a kahal of people an assembly of people, a multitude of people, a group of people for God. That's the first occurrence. Now, look further on in this same chapter. Again, we can't go into the detail of this chapter. But do you remember he fell asleep on that pillar, didn't he? Jacob awaked, verse 18. So, sorry, verse 16. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, Surely... Yahweh is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful. And that's in terms of how awe-inspiring uh, is this place. This is none other, note, but the house of God. This multitude, this assembly is being associated with the house of God. We, brothers and sisters, are part of that assembly. We are the house of God, aren't we? And so it's as if, when we come to the book of Ecclesiastes, my dear brothers and sisters, the, the, the words echo down the 3,000 years ago when it was penned. For us, the house of God, yes, we're living in the 21st century, but the principles and the ideals and the values of God are the same. And here it is, the first occurrence of Cahel being linked with the house of God. Now, more than that, um, of course, the best way to find a word that is the equivalent in the New Testament of the Old Testament is if we can find a quotation in Scripture of that word. So come with me to Psalm 22. And a few more references around this, and we'll move on um, in Ecclesiastes. But, of course... We know what Psalm 22 is. Looking forward, 
remarkably accurately and uh, inspiration to our Lord, isn't it? Psalm 22. Look at verse 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will praise thee. Ye that fear Yahweh, praise him, all ye the seed of Jacob. Now that's interesting, isn't it? It goes back to Jacob. We've just been from Jacob, haven't we, in, in Genesis 28. Glorify him and fear him. Now that's interesting. Fear God and keep his commandments. Him, all ye the seed of Israel. But note the word congregation is the word kahal in the midst of the assembly, or as we've seen, the house of God, the congregation of God's people, the house of Jacob, by the promises. Israel, the Israel of God. So we're seeing some wonderful connecting things, but where is this quoted then? Incidentally, you're allowed to, um, to shout out if you want to. Hebrews 2. Come on, let's go to Hebrews 2. So, Psalm 22 is quoted in Hebrews 2. Verse 11, please. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. And we were thinking this yesterday, weren't we? This, this oneness in Christ. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will, and this is picking up Psalm 22, declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the, in the AV, church. I will sing praise unto thee. So church is the same word as congregation in verse 22 of Psalm 22. Now in the original Greek, the word church is ecclesia. which comes from, actually, kahal. But in the Greek, it's translated ecclesia. So this is why the Greek then is brought back and the book of Ecclesiastes is headed up, Ecclesiastes. So it's a Greek title given to the book, The Preacher the gatherer, the assembler. That's how we get the name Ecclesiastes for the book. It's brought back uh, from the Greek. So it's as if when we come to our book, let's, let's go back there um, to Ecclesiastes then. So what we find is the preacher is addressing the house of God, the assembly of God, the congregation of God. Now, I'm just going to go uh, right across to Ecclesiastes 12. Because the important thing for us, my dear brothers and sisters, is that they're not the preacher's words at all. They're God's words. They're words of God, delivered by the preacher. And we just want to examine a little bit around chapter 12 uh, in this context. So, verse 9, And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. And we'll come back to that later in the week, God willing. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words in the margin, words of delight. The word acceptable, keep your finger in chapter 12, but chapter 3 is translated um, purpose, words of purpose. So verse 1 of chapter 3, as an example, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose. That's the same word as acceptable in chapter 12 under the heaven. And I, and I draw your attention to that just to say that often in the Hebrew we have different colours of, of meaning. And so when we're d dealing with words, acceptable words, we're saying meaningful words, words of purpose. God's words aren't idle words, are they are arbitrary words, are they? So when we come to this book, they're words of meaning, words of purpose, 
words to bring thought to us, as they will do. Um, and, and that which was written was upright, even note words of truth. You see, brothers and sisters, I don't need to tell you, we live in a world where there's so many words of lies and untruth happening. At every part of you know, the strata of mankind, whether we look at governments, whether we look at individuals, it's sad, isn't it? That there are so many lies being perpetuated with humanism and evolution and, and all the rest that are set out to deceive us and our children and what a wonderful and blessed thing it is that we can come together and, and just focus on the words of truth together, not words of lies. And, and the lies started in the Garden of Eden, didn't they? And the world, sadly, isn't so different than that. Now, let's just... There's a slide there uh, regarding Kahal, which, which you're, you're very welcome to um, later on. And then it goes on, doesn't it? The words of the wise, verse 11, are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. Words as goads. And I suppose the scriptures are intended to be like that, aren't they? That we read them daily, and it's like prodding us in the right direction, isn't it? It's, it's awakening and reawakening our conscience before God. When we read the scriptures, when we think, yeah, I should be doing more of that, and it pricks our conscience, and rightly so, doesn't it? And God's words should be like that in our lives, to keep us moving, that we might move, as the prophet says, right on looking forward to the kingdom of God. And there is nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And, and as we, we have this idea, don't we, of, of something being fastened. In, in fact, the word fastened, do you remember yesterday we looked at the word as trees planted in Psalm 144? It's the same word, fastened. It's as if saying, the words of God should be fastened like that. that we can't add or take away from the words of God, can we? We shouldn't be. And this is what they must be in our lives. The things of God, the things of the truth, don't change, brothers and sisters. They're the same. And for our children, they're the same. And we pass these things down, Psalm 48, don't we, to our, the next generation. The hope of Israel. And the words of God must be like that to us. Nails fastened. No, let's go back to the word. We're, we're having opportunities of preaching a lot. I mentioned briefly the, the uh, influx of Iranians. We've got about 50 um, coming to our meeting at Salem. We're only a, a, a meeting of 80, so that's uh, quite a lot for us to do. Uh, but it's just a joy to be helping. Let's look, go back to the Bible. Let's see what it says. No, let's, let's see what the Bible says about this uh, as, as we help them to learn the truth and the things of God. But there's a very important word there, very important phrase. Look how verse 11 ends. All these words, brothers and sisters, all these words to be sought out by the preacher bit like the Bereans, let's search and see these things, if they be true. These acceptable words, these words of truth, where are they ultimately from? End of verse 11. Keep your marker there, but come to Psalm 80. One shepherd. One shepherd. Psalm 80, verse 1, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that ledest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubim, shine forth. And so he has in his word of truth, hasn't he, this one shepherd, all these words, they're inspired words from the one shepherd, from God. Yes, delivered through the preacher for our learning. 
And that's the remarkable thing about the scriptures. I've already had some lovely conversations with, with brothers and sisters at this school, just, just talking about the wonder of the scriptures themselves, the internal consistency of them. Um, in, in, uh, j just as an aside, where it says the masters of assemble is there in verse 11, that is a completely different word from kahal, so don't get misled there. Uh, the word assemble is, 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 is quite different um, from that. It means collections, the masters of collections. So what we have for us in Ecclesiastes is a collection of words from God. And we're directed to them through Koheleth, through the assembler. Now, just come back to chapter 7. I, I said this was a, a pivotal chapter, and we'll, we'll see this emerge. We're just sowing some seeds today, brethren and sisters. Um, Ecclesiastes 7. Verse 25, I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. So here's the preacher searching, and we'll be looking at this a lot tomorrow, searching and seeking and, and wanting to find out the truth of these things. Has this world got anything to offer? Am I mistaken? What should I be looking for? And it, he goes on this quest, doesn't he? But more of that tomorrow. And, but here you see is the contrast. Or the wickedness of folly. That's an interesting phrase in itself, isn't it? That folly is wickedness. The wickedness of folly. It's a wicked thing to be foolish before God, even of foolishness and madness. Is there anything, it's as, if, it's as if we're being asked the question, isn't it, is there anything beyond the madness of this world? And of course, by God's blessing, we can see that there is. And I find more bitter, and so on, in verse 26. Um, now, there's an interesting little connection um, in the New Testament, Acts chapter 26, just picking up this idea of words of truth against the madness of this world. Which way are we going to go? That's the challenge, isn't it? Are we going to say that this world is acceptable? The madness of this world, which the vast majority on this planet do, sadly? Or are we going to see something in the words of of truth. First, um, chapter 26 of Acts, we have an interesting little discourse. And this is uh, the occasion when Paul was before Festus. Verse 25. <laughs> well, just look at verse 24 to begin with. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Now, much learning doth make thee mad. That's an echo of Ecclesiastes 12, isn't it? Learning in this world makes us mad. And, and Paul is being accused of this now. It's as if it's the other way around. But, verse 25, but he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth. Exactly the same words that we find in Ecclesiastes. I'm speaking the words of truth, Festus. Listen to the words of God. These are the words. I'm not mad. Not like the world you see around you. I'm speaking the words of truth. God's words. And soberness. And so, this is what we'll be looking at. The words of truth from God. And back in uh, Ecclesiastes 12, you see, there's the other contrast, isn't it? Verse 12, uh, and further by these my son be admonished, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness to the flesh. 
indeed, much study of the things of this world do become a weariness. Come over to 1 Corinthians, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Because if, if there's a discourse on the foolishness of this world in comparison to the wonder and the beauty and the truth of the things of God, it's got to be Corinthians, hasn't it? So eloquently put for us. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the, of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, by its wisdom, knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that, were be that believe. Isn't that so true of today? That the, the philosophies, the sciences, the so-called progress of man, the so-called wisdom have caused man to completely lose their way in terms of understanding the great creator and the sustainer of the very planet on which we live. How sad is that? Now, I'm going to leave that there. Um, that's a few seeds uh, sown, which we'll be picking up, God willing, through the week. And the last um, while that we've got together at this point, I, I want to look at the structure of Ecclesiastes. Now, again, as I said at the outset, sometimes we come to Ecclesiastes and, and read through it. It's a little bit like the book of Proverbs, isn't it? We think, you know, we're reading through and we're just getting into a flow of, of uh, a debate, an argument, whatever, uh, of the text. And then this verse comes in from the side and we think, so what's that doing there? Where's that come from? And what am I supposed to understand from this? And, and, and then we see a different tack taken. Uh, and the next chapter might be addressing a different subject or three chapters apart, there might be some similar ideas and themes going. So, so how can we map out? Now, I've done a lot of reading um, from, from different brethren and, and elsewhere of suggestions. Um, and by and large, uh, they take it uh, chapter by chapter and, and stop at verse such and such and pick it up. Um, and, and I think there is some merit to that. Uh, but there's also some discrepancies as well. So I'm going to offer you um, what I've found very helpful, having read it through several times to try and just get a, a feel of, of what's going on. And I offer it to you as, a, as something to work with, uh, and, and even if you don't go for the structure that I'm going to present to you in a few moments, um, certainly the themes that are presented through this structure are there for us. So let me just take you through this. That's um, a weaving up in the top right, if you can't see what it is, a mat with some weaving. And if I zoom in <clears throat> to a closer structure, we get the idea, okay? So a weave, of course, is whatever, wool or whatever. It, it, it's going in and out and reappears and disappears for a moment and reappears again uh, a little bit later. On reading Ecclesiastes, it seems to me that some of the themes and the ideas and the phrases are exactly like that and we'll be seeing, I believe, through the week exactly this happening. Now, let me put some words against this. I hope you can just about make out those words. So down the left, I've got preacher, knowledge, seeking out. These are some of the key words and themes in Ecclesiastes. Wise, of course, comes up. Purpose, forever. Uh, and along the top, I've got time, speech, uh, beasts, uh, and making and building things, chapter 2, for example. Time, that's chapter 3, a time for this, a time for that. Speech, watching the tongue, chapter 5. Uh, and the beast, chapter 3 and chapter 9, about comparing life and death and beasts, they perish, and so on. And key words down, down the left. So in my studies, brothers and sisters, I, I just started nearly at random picking up some words and saying, I wonder where this word will take me. I wonder where this phrase will take me. Let's just look at it 
you know, um, just openly uh, and, and see what God is teaching uh, me and us. So, let's uh, progress a little bit. Now, this is where it really starts getting interesting. We've already looked at Kohelet, seven occurrences in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. Then you look at, and, and this is all in the original, not, not in the English translation, but in the original. Uh, so, knowledge, da'at, seven times. Okay, you know, you might think, okay, so that's fair enough. And then you pick up another word, wise. And there are different words for wisdom, but this particular one, um, wise. Well, that's, that's more than interesting. That's 21 times. That's three sevens. Now, I, I don't know, brothers and sisters, whether you are the sort of brother or sister that um, enjoys numerics in the Bible, but wherever you are on, on that continuum of, of don't think anything of them to thinking you know, a lot of them, I think we'd all accept that seven has got to be an important number in God's purpose. We only have to think of Jericho, we only have to think of the book of Revelation, don't we? And, and sevens uh, are clearly uh, the creation uh, important in God's purpose. So let's, let's go with that. And then you start looking at a few more words. Purpose, again in the original, seven times. So there's something here, there's something going on. Um, forever, the word olam. And uh, it's interesting, I, I have my study upstairs in, in my house in, in Manchester and uh, Joseph has been doing his GCSE exams uh, recently in, in his room and uh, he, he kept hearing me shout out, I've got another one! Uh, um, so he, he would come across and ask what it was. So we had a bit of fun just looking at words, nearly at random. And, and then a lot of these words as well seem to terminate in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. You know, this, this is an accident, brothers and sisters. Th this is the sort of time, I, I don't know about you in your studies, that I, I just have to sometimes put my pen down and just sit back and think, this, this is amazing. This, this word of God has done it again. Just overwhelmed with um, the... the the patterns that are there, but it doesn't stop there, and you just go on. Vexation of spirit, that phrase, seven times. Um, the word owners in the original, seven times. Acceptable, seven times. Another word for wisdom, 28 times. Um, folly, seven times. Judgment, seven times. Uh, and actually now I'm in some correspondence with some other brothers who are um, feeding me with, with others, and I'm, I'm finding others, and Joseph's finding some others. So it's remarkable, brothers and sisters. It's as if God has has put some you know, sub-pattern underneath this to say, yes, look at these words. And it's as if it's got a divine blueprint to say, look at these words, look at the patterns that are there. So what we find, that, that the bottom line of this, I, I believe, is that through Ecclesiastes, we have themes going vertically, but also we have themes, words, phrases, going horizontally through the book. And that's why in the weave of this remarkable book, sometimes this phrase or word appears, and then it dips down, then it comes up again, and it's a theme in its own right. So we have to look horizontally to get the answer sometimes, often terminating in chapter 12, as well as some of the more obvious themes, like time, a time for this, time for that, going vertically. Brothers and sisters, I offer it to you as food for thought. Uh, if it's helpful, that's, that's good. Um, and if you've got already some ideas around um, how it's uh, structured, Ecclesiastes, great, uh, no problem. And I'm sure um, that the, the two work together. Um, so if we just magnify this again, let's just take one little strand, one word. Let's take Olam, for example. Okay, and just see how it appears. And this is why when we read through Ecclesiastes, we think, well, what, where's that come from? Why are we suddenly talking about Olam? Um, that's because there's, there's a theme going horizontally through. And it's a progressive theme so often that it starts here with some basic points and then takes us to the resolution 
of what God is trying to tell us. We will see this through the week, God willing. We'll be following some of these themes and, and learning a lot from it, I hope. So let's just take Olam as, as a case study, very briefly. Um, so the first time it's used uh, in 1 and verse 4, the, the earth abides forever. That's, that's, the, that's the word, Olam, forever. Okay, so it's a fairly um, clear statement back in Ecclesiastes. The next time it come, comes is, is 1.10. It's used to show that nothing new is from old time. There's nothing new from old. And then the next time in 2 verse 16, in days to come all will be forgotten forever. So it's starting to help us think more spiritually now. There will be a day when all things of this life will be forgotten. <coughs> Again, this will be a theme that will come up later in our week, God willing. And he set the everlasting in the heart of the believer. Again, we'll be looking at that in detail on day three, I believe. What does that mean? But God has given us something everlasting that we can look forward to, something forever, as opposed to the madness and the temporiness of this world. And what God does, you see, is forever. And this is where our eyes need to be focused on God's eternal things, isn't it? And without God, there is no portion forever. So make your choice. You can be with the things of God forever, or you can have no portion in the things of God forever. It's a serious choice. Which way are we going to go? Ecclesiastes will challenge us time and time and time again this week, my dear brothers and sisters. Where are our perspectives? Where are our priorities in life? And there'll be some very practical lessons coming out for us. And then without God, you see, this is the end. We go to our long home. It's translated long in the English. It's the same word, Olam, forever, of death. That's our lot without God. And yet here we are, with our scriptures open, considering eternal things. So that's, um, I hope, a, a helpful look at an aspect of the structure of Ecclesiastes. Now there's one area I want to briefly address before we start rounding things off. And that is, and it's not surprising that through Ecclesiastes we have a, a sort of a, a sub-theme of creation. And I say it's not surprising because really Ecclesiastes is saying you've got to make a choice. And you know what? That's where it all started, isn't it? In the Garden of Eden. But the wrong choice was made. And we see that reversed in the Lord Jesus Christ in a garden where the right choice was made. And Ecclesiastes continually takes us back to creation. So let me just put up a next slide. Um, now I know that's going to be a little bit small for those at the back. Um, but we have, of course, Abel, Hebel in Hebrew, which is the word for vanity. And although his life was cut off and short, he is the one, Hebrews 11, that was regarded as faithful. He made the right choice, didn't he? In sacrifice and offering to God. The word vexation and keeper is there in creation. Chapter 4 and verse 2 of Genesis. Knowledge, of course. What sort of knowledge are we seeking? takes us back to creation, that choice. The days of life, sorrows are there in Ecclesiastes and creation. Seasons, of course, are there in Ecclesiastes and creation. The one breath, what are we doing with the breath that God gives us? Are we using our breath to help our brothers and sisters and encourage? Made man upright and good. And so in Ecclesiastes, we have the serpent in both 
And of course, remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. It's going back to get our perspectives right. Wherever you are in life, remember it all started with a creator, with God. Whatever we have, whatever we're doing, whatever our state, it's of God. And in fact, Adam is there. Um, just uh, if you've got Ecclesiastes, let's, let's just uh, go to Ecclesiastes 12. Isn't it interesting that uh, verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of Adam. The duty isn't there, of course, in the original. And the word man there is Adam. <laughs> really, that's, that's what our life should be about, isn't it? This, this should have been Adam, but Adam didn't accept it. Originally, and back in the garden, in creation, this should be the whole of Adam, to manifest God, shouldn't it? To keep his commands, to fear God, to keep his commands. This should be the whole of each of us. We'll look at this, God willing, again next Saturday. And of course, the difference between good and evil. The choice was there in the Garden of Eden, and this choice is being presented to us again in Ecclesiastes, in our perspectives. Are we going to see that there's something in this world worth seeking after? Or not? And we think of him, don't we, who chose the good and refused the evil because his mind was set on eternal things. Every one of us in this room need to do the same, brothers and sisters, don't we? To choose the good, to make the right choice, to see the world for what it is, but to focus on the words of truth. So two final references, please, then. Um, Romans chapter 8. It's as if, nearly, this is an inspired commentary on the book of Ecclesiastes. And I remember reading once that these uh, words here in Romans 8 were some of C.C. C. Walker's favourite words. Romans 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. So there is hope out of vanity. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So what we're being told is, yes, the creation groaneth in the vanity of this world. But by definition, God has given us a hope. A hope of glorious days to come my beloved brothers and sisters. And we're going to end in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 with a word of hope. Because as we come here to Bible school from our own families, some of which are here, some of whom I know that you've left behind in various situations and places through the country and indeed through the world, we can take courage, can't we, 
that we have hope together of the things of the kingdom. And it's important that whatever situation we are encountering in our own lives at the moment, brothers and sisters, some of them will be sad, some of them will be grappling with difficulties with people and things of, of this life, families, that while there is life, there is hope. And we have to move forward with this in mind, don't we? Verse 4 of Ecclesiastes 9. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. So we leave it on that note, and we'll pick up today, uh, tomorrow and see the quest that Solomon embarked on and see some of the outcomes of that.